put my glasses on so I can see what we're doing. Any apologies? I do have an apology from Councillor Faulkner for lateness. She's on her way in. So I'm happy to move that. Seconded by Councillor Farahina. All in favour? Contrary carried. We move on to our declaration of interest. Nothing around the table. Okay, Councillor, let's go to page five. That's our minutes, our draft and unconfirmed minutes. So if you have any feedback into in regards to those minutes, then we also have just on the next page, page nine, the public excluded minutes, which are just for noting. Any questions or queries? If not, is someone willing to move it? Councillor Dowsing, seconded by Councillor Seymour. All in favour? Contrary carried. Councillor Cranston, do you have a question? Yeah, just... Um... Sometimes when you read them, they're not clear. There's this, on page seven, it's got uh, the walking and cycling grant had impacted on rivers, land and coastal outcome. And I wasn't sure what that actually meant. And then I got thinking about other meetings that I go to, um, other organisations. And we've, we've kind of gone to a place where we try and get the minutes as quick as possible to read them. I know with the chairs, quite often we'll get the minutes for review after a couple of weeks. But now that we're on to a six weekly, sort of rotation, I think it would be really handy if councillors could see the minutes fresher to the meeting. I don't know if that's unpractical, but, but you know, to actually see the minutes a bit fresher to the meeting would give us a better way of sort of Thanks. indicating whether it was, everything was as we as we felt. So usually the chair gets the meeting the yeah, minutes, um, and then <laughs> have a quick read of it just to see if it makes sense, mm. but, um, are there any practical reasons stopping it being sent out, Ms. Con? Um, other than sending our staff, most of the meetings. Yeah, no, I, I thought because the chairs get it, can we then, can all councillors get that same thing to review? Because they're doing it for us anyway. It's not Staff, an issue. Well, the chairs have it first. Yeah. And then once the chairs have said okay, yeah. then we can send it first. Oh, I don't know if it'd be. I can even cut out a, a stage out of that. Why not send to everyone and people that have any issues need to get back to the chair and the chair gives feedback to the committee people because then you don't have to deal with 14 feedback. Yeah. People yeah. need to give their feedback to the chair if they disagree with what the minutes are. And then so just the process now when it gets sent to the chair, send it to all councillors and the onus are on people that do want to make a, a to give back, get back to the chair within two days, mm. um, and then the chair then say yes or change this. So I think that probably won't be the five until they turn around whether this is done. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah I realise that could be a can of worms and it would still have to be um, matters of clarity rather than yep. anything else. No? Yep. yep. That's all good. Thank you for that, Councillor Seymour. Did I put it to the floor? Not Seymour. Councillor Seymour, Cranston. <laughs> No, did I put it to the floor? No. I did. I did. Councillor Seymour, did you have a question? Well, I was just going to supplementary to the matters raised by Councillor Cranston, and I hadn't noticed it, but now that I see it, I think we, it should be made clear what that's really saying, which is what Councillor Cranston raised. So is it intended at 10.2.2? Because it's not draft that impacts on rivers and drainage, but it might be some project that impacts on. I can't hear what you're saying. You just I said it might it wouldn't be the grant that impacted on rivers land, but it might be a project that impacted. It doesn't it doesn't really make it clear what and I mean I know it's in response to questions and I hear what Councillor Cranston said, because sometimes when there's been a whole pile of questions, you get just the responses, but we haven't got questions. Um, but that that doesn't it does need to be made clear what that's actually saying too. The chair. But it should be picked up by the chair with the greatest respect because that's what the, that's why the minutes are sent to the chairs first. So for, for the chair, that is just referring at the moment to some new debt and it says that the, oh big pardon, I forgot. <laughs> Um, so that was a sundry debt report and it was saying in that particular one for that area they had higher debt than the other activities and they said that that uh, higher debt was because of the grant that was still um, for the land rivers and Jane. so it was in relation to uh, a topic with it but that clarification of that um, okay. Okay. 
Okay, let's go to our um, action sheet, which is on page 13. Okay, any questions in that regard? Councillor Farahenga. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I was just wanting to know in regards to 12.1, which is the first item uh, on the action sheet, uh, when is all that technical data be due? Because the due date was July. I don't know Helen was on the um, Zoom before, but I can, in the course of this, I can get that back cool. to you um, okay. for the response, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, councillors, this take me to our first report of the day. The LGFA, the annual meeting, and recommendations, which we don't usually debate in detail because it's not really um, for us to, um, it's quite straightforward. Councillor Seymour, did you in indicate that you're happy to I'm move happy those? To move, Madam Chair. All in favour? Any questions or queries from Pauline? You're quite happy for us just to pass as is. We do this annually. It's we do do that annually. There is a um, a little bit more of a matter of emphasis when anything happens with a, a change in the foundation yep. documents, but they're not substantive or anything there. They're just for clarification and clearing that up. I think the the one substantive change was to their um, appointment process and um, yeah. and the rotation cycle. So that was good to see because does have a long life on some of those appointments. Okay, councillors, welcome Eloise. We move straight to our annual report for um, our museum. You can take it as read, welcome. And if you want to give us a little for it or just as we start off with you, can just like that as we could. Oh, Mori and Akoto. I'm glad I arrived promptly this morning. <laughs> Thank you for the welcome. I'm really pleased to present um, our, um, the museum's annual report for the past year. It's been um, a time of sort of great uncertainty for, for everyone. So we're really pleased um, to have to be able to present such a positive annual report. Um, I was really pleased with the high um, levels of community satisfaction with the museum. And also, uh, while we didn't quite meet our visitor target for the year, considering we have no international visitors and our events program and education program were all massively disrupted to be a couple of hundred off our, off our target, which we hadn't even altered during, due to um, COVID was um, really gratifying for the team. Uh, we've been able to carry on with our exhibition program as usual and our, most, most things we've really been able to get stuck in and carry on as usual and, and because, we're, as I've said in previous meetings, because we're such a cute community oriented museum, um, it's relatively easy for us to do that, to rely on our own resources locally, um, whether they be artists or other people, so we've been able to carry on. Uh, we did um, one highlight for the year for us was the launch of our collections online database. So this is a online searchable database where any member of the public can go on and look into the region's history um, collections, whether they be archives or taonga Māori or art. Uh, and that's going to be great. That's, we've got about 6,000 plus objects on there so far, and that's going to be growing over time. So um, being able to put some time and energy into increasing our digital and online resources has been something that we've been able to do because we've had a little bit more time um, due to COVID-19, so that's a, a positive outcome for us as well. Especially in these COVID times, we might be viewing a few more things digitally anyway, so a good step to make sure people can... Absolutely, absolutely keep the access up, and we did notice during the first lockdown, we didn't have this online database. During the most recent one we did, and we saw when the museum was closed, a big spike in people accessing online resources. So it was neat to see that. Well, thank you, um, Anna Louise, and thank you for, um, I always enjoy walking through the museum and I sometimes take my little nephews there, have a coffee and have a snack, and I really enjoy going, you know, just the boat experience. And um, I enjoy looking at the mirror robe. And the, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just 
kidding. Thank you for the work that you do, do on, on behalf of our community there. And I know a lot of people do enjoy that part of that. Councillor, any questions of Eloise? Councillor Cranston, Farahenga Foster. Yeah, thanks for that, Eloise. Um, yeah, I always like getting the museum report. And uh, I would like to, uh, with your engaging the communities, when I saw not achieved in red, not, I went back to, I thought, oh, for me, that's achieved, really. <laughs> and you, you've increased the visitor numbers considerably, and you've only just fallen short of it. So, so to see that not achieved in red, I'd, I'd just twink through that. <laughs> um, with the education program, just wondering whether there's a cost per head, because I see there's 1,300 more students, but there's 16.4K less funding. Uh, that's just an accounting. Um, it's uh, the the funding hasn't changed. We receive um, funding through a contract with the Ministry of Education, and they fund us on a calendar year, like the school year. And so, some, because we're reporting on a June to July um, year, just the timing when the funding comes in. So they would. Uh, does it require more funding for the extra thirty? Oh, so it students? doesn't require. No, yeah. it doesn't require um, more funding. Um, we we are actually going to be um, just starting making a new request, um, a new negotiating a new con um, um, sorry I've lost my words a new agreement with the Ministry of Education, um, and we you know the school age report you know number numbers in the district are increasing, so we do want to reach more and more students. Um, so we will be looking for an increase in funding to see if we can you know improve our outreach and all those sorts of things we do. Um, but we, we work a lot in partnership with other organisations as well, whether it be C Company, House, or Eastwood Hill Arboretum. So, you know, mm. we make the money go as far as we can. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Your Worship. Kia ora, Louise. Thank you very much for your report. Um, awesome in regards to the electronic database, um, just in line with what um, Councillor Cranston was was uh, suggesting around the MOE funding. I I know I've heard from feedback from the community that the uptick in regards to engagement with the electronic database during our lockdown period was some school children and things like that. Possible conversations to be had in regards to our MOE obligations. I'll, I'll leave that with you. But in line with the electronic database stuff, um, uh, because I know that you hold on to a lot of Tonga for in regards to our sister cities relationships. Um, are we able to identify those ones in order for, because I sit on our sister cities committee, for us to be able to partner with that out to our international partners, I guess, to be able to possibly engage with that database. So you, will you guys be able to do that? Yeah, that's a great idea. What I'd have to do is actually check what objects have been uploaded onto the database already. We've been prioritising putting up objects where we've got photographs and kind of more information attached. So uh, maybe that's something we can come around back to later. I can have a look with the team about what's up there um, or make a, make a plan for that, and then we can share that. Awesome, awesome, thank you very much. Um, one other question that I did I did want to ask, it's more to, uh, to staff, was about our um, unscheduled repairs and maintenance. Was any of that able to be put into scheduled? Fully. For the future? For the future, I will leave that to James. I believe that some, some of that work has been um, working through now, but I'll leave Mr. Baby. Um, well, I'm probably more on the contract service side, but Penny, did you want to make any comments in relation to any repairs and maintenance work that you're aware of that's been scheduled? I know there has been some stuff done and would have been oh, working on it. It, it um, was less about what's, uh, what's in line to be scheduled and more about in the unscheduled program of works, are we planning on moving any of the unscheduled stuff into scheduled stuff over in future years? That's for the long-term plan. Um, it's yeah, just just in terms of uh, so the long term plan has the annual um, services grant, and then there's in the that agreement there is certain works that we do to the outside of the buildings and around mowing and what have you, and that's the scheduled work. The unscheduled things are things that are completely unexpected. Yeah. So, um, well, not completely unexpected. You can always anticipate some. 
thing going wrong. So the most of that 20, whatever thousand it is, is to do with um, unscheduled clearing of leaves on the roof and what have you, and little repairs and heat testing, heat um, investigations on the roof as well. Well, yeah, that was more of the attention of my question. If we, if we know that we're going to be clearing off the leaves, say off the, the roof or the museum regularly, should we schedule those things in? Some, some of that is scheduled and, and budgeted for, but um, when, when we haven't got enough funding to do um, what we've scheduled, uh, we've got the, the budget is there for the scheduled work, but sometimes it requires more maintenance than what we've scheduled for. Yeah, so for just different weather conditions and circumstances, and our scheduled work is contracted to recreation services, so mm -hmm. it's what, within what they are mandated to do there. So what I'm hearing is no. But no, we're not going to. No, we need to do future planning for, um, I guess, the, uh, yeah, uh, circumstances that we haven't been able to plan for currently. Okay. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've kind of along the similar lines, actually. I know we've got a report coming out in um, February about um, the roof maintenance and everything. But um, oh, congratulations on the report, too, Louise. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, um, the maintenance bill this year is um, 12 grand higher than last year, 36,000 as opposed to 24 or 36,334 as opposed to 24,071 last time. So yeah, my question is, um, what, what is that extra maintenance that you're having to do? Is, um, you know, is, it, is it leaks or, um, or is it something else that you need to do around the museum area? Uh, so most of the maintenance, so under the uh, lease agreement between council and the museum trust, um, responsibility for internal, internal maintenance, um, maintenance lies with the museum trust and external maintenance with the council. Uh, so uh, most of the things, my understanding with the council with the council costs has been around leaks, primarily as we know around the roof the roof leaks, which then have knock on effects, um, and uh, so that's an portion of external maintenance and then the museum is meeting internal maintenance costs as well. So um, the biggest ongoing problem um, is the roof, um, but also it's it's um, it's a big and aging building to, and it has quite high maintenance needs because of the way it's constructed and all of those sorts of things. So um, but the, the roof is the big, the big issue, which then causes a lot of um, knock-on effects in terms of kind of damage to other parts of the building. Um, any other questions of Eloise um, in regards to the annual report? Maybe Moved by Councillor Dowds and seconded by Councillor Warsaw. Eloise, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad you were on time because <laughs> we've run things on time here. Beautiful. <laughs> all in favour? Thanks Lovely. a lot. For your time. Thank you all so much for your time and your support of the museum and look forward to working with you all and your and the staff council over the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. So Pauline, do you want to, it's quite straightforward, um, and all these reports we can take as read. Um, you want to give a quick corridor on page 128, or are you just open for questions? I think open for questions, I think it's the same, yes. yep. and it's not anything significantly different from Councillor Warsnop. Um, my question just on page 132 relates to um, a point that was raised in the, in the minutes for the last um, meeting. Uh, with regards to the mortgagee processes that are still recorded as being 26 or 28 percent so just whether we found out what's going on there given that last year and I presume this year we're not um, actually doing those but gee I should have brought that up um, so in terms of this that's there it's a little bit misleading in terms of it it's the type of debt um, assigned to the property, meaning that um, we haven't collected, you're quite right, in the last two years of um, any uh, mortgage um, process, um, but it refers to those types of property that have general land and that they have a mortgage on their property. So it means that it could be um, taking that option if we chose to take that. It's not as actually, um, so that's the amount of debt that's there that's recognised. Um, 
under that category. So yes, clarification on that one. Good up, Pauline. Any other questions or queries? If not, is someone willing to move this report? Councillor Faulkner moves, seconded by Councillor Bedet. No more questions. Councillor Seymour. Sorry, Madam Chair, not to bring it up sooner. Um, it's page 133, and it's the regional leadership and support services overdue 90 days. And I just wondered what has made that a little bit higher than normal. Uh, that one is mostly uh, a consent uh, development contribution um, consent that has been worked through, and the person's playing uh, part payment as, as a progress payment um, with it. So uh, that is the majority of that one. All in favour? Contrary, carry. Thank you, councillors. We move to our treasury report on page one thirty four. Thank you for this, Pauline. Any Should, comments you want to make? Yeah, I, I'll just, it's probably the standard, but just to um, where we're going and, and what we have and where we are at at the moment, you will see that um, the debt is saying it's 80.7, but underlying that we do have cash um, that's in there. Um, part of that reason is that we pre-funded some of our debt that was coming up in April um, that related to uh, 7.1 million because of the, the rates that we would have received is at this point, it was better to actually get that and secure that now. Um, so there are those sort of things as we lead in through this progress uh, process, um, we know that the, the longer term debt that's coming up will be the wastewater treatment plant. And so that will add automatically to our long term debt. Some of them are fluctuations that we should come, comes and goes, but that will be part of that. Um, and as we know that the process of the free water reforms, um, uh, how that comes and how that impacts of uh, our debt, we're, we're managing those kind of processes uh, for over the, the sort of that three year period um, and how do we actually retire some of those things. So we're going through that and understanding that and being pretty active um, during this process, just to understand what are the next steps or what do we need to do. But I'm happy to take any questions. Councillor Faulkner and then Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Pauline. Um, you've actually partially answered my question. Uh, it was more around um, support and uh, direction coming around through waters reform uh, from central government or um, DIA or any of the others. Um, do you feel like there's, you have in, enough information to be presenting on this or do you still feel a wee bit in the dark? Until there's a legislative change, um, yes, we, we have to work on that. We've had an indication that there is going to be a legislative. So in probability of what we've been said now, we have to work to make sure that we've got mechanisms in place to be able to work through. So we're trying to do the um, cover both, but basically we pr predominantly are managing and how we work through this to be able to uh, have a least impact on council um, as of the, the time that it, if it occurs, when it occurs. Um, and we work uh, with PwC, uh, the Treasury, to actually do that. We have other external impacts that we're actually trying to work through and how do we do that? And then also um, making sure that uh, we're in the best position that we possibly can be, meaning uh, if we've got debt or we've got other obligations that we would be uh, facing, um, and that's on the residual rate payers, we will be positioning ourselves as much as we possibly can to make sure that that is recognised. So that is part of the process um, that we are trying to capture and formulate at the moment. Councillor Seymour, Councillor Walsnop, Councillor Dowson. Uh, thank you very much um, for the comprehensive financial reports, but just does throw up the odd question. So on page 135, um, around the, the point that you just made that uh, external debt is currently 80 million lower than the year to date budget. Um, do we do an assessment of how much interest that has been charged? Because I know the rate is only paying for the interest, but that's three months of 80 interest on 80 million is actually quite a bit of interest 
So is that available for other projects? Because we've raised it for that in our rates, haven't we? So that is being paid into council. What do we do with that money? And does it meet other projects where there's overrun? So, so there's a couple of things with it. Um, what we did uh, at the end of last year, because we had lower interest costs than we expected, and when we came from the draft to the final, we assessed what that was, so we didn't rate for it twice, and we transferred those kind of impacts um, to special funds um, in saying that rather than uh, rating for that twice, we will reduce the cost for this year. We will do the same sort of things at the end of this year if there's less than what we expected. And so that's the mechanism we try to reduce that overall. We have to do, uh, as part of that process, what is expected, what, when do you think that they will be phased and when will the interest occur? But if it doesn't, then we look at that mechanism um, sort of around uh, the, the draft uh, to the final annual plan and we adjust it in those cases. So we minimize that rating twice for the rate pay. So I'll start from you, thank you. Is that visible to us anywhere? Where, where can we look and see that um, sum that might be available from the 2021 year or the 2020 year last year, as opposed to this, which is accruing already in the current year? Um, that was reported uh, in the annual report. Something. No, no, that was part of that. When we, before you adopted the LTP, we said, what is it? What have we reduced? What we and I can't remember the, the amount, but we actually said it was about 500k at that particular point, and we said it was from the wastewater treatment plant. And how would we actually minimise those impacts and what are the things? So we will we will continue to do that before we actually adopt the annual plan to say what is the mechanisms, what have we looked at, and how do we reduce um, those overall. Thank you. Councillor Warsnop and then Councillor Dowsing. Everyone, speak up. It's Either my ears are blocked today, but I can't hear people. It's hard to hear today. Our yeah, acoustics are obviously moisture in the air. challenging. Um, so my question is just around how we're tracking, um, given that we, um, obviously we have 42 million of interest rate cover in place, but that's by no means the entirety of, um, you know, there's still a lot that's not covered and we've got a volatile interest rate environment. Um, We've also got facilities that are available, but they are both in the two and three year band, which is quite short term. If we were to utilize those, does that mean that we would likely breach our debt corridor, the maximum of that debt corridor? Um, so uh, probably the best way of explaining is on page 138. Um, and uh, 138 corridor policy is to say between that on that graph there is a, the maroon color which is where we are over time and in that there is a black lower um, rate which is benchmark and then there's a middle one that's the corridor that we need to be in okay so that's the policy and so in terms of that we actually on go and look at it we, we are and it has for each of those policies, what's the maximum and the minimum? Are we within that? And as we go longer, we need to make sure that we get the swaps and things um, in terms of that. Now, why there is a lesser uh, amount as the further you go out? Because there's less certainty of those projects. And so that's how we manage it. But each time it changes with the corridor and the forecast of it, we would change within that. So the policies gets below or any particular those years would say, okay, we need to adjust some of that to have more swaps um, and cover. And part of that uh, monthly um, that we actually have with uh, the treasury, uh, PwC treasury is to say, actually the markets are changing a bit. Um, some of this might, uh, warrant you to take um, a little bit more swaps or whatever if you have got certainty <laughs> over your debt. So that's part of an ongoing basis that we review to make sure we get cover um, as much as possible. Supplementary to that, given um, the environment that we are um, uh, using swaps in is, is not as, uh, I guess, um, it's not as conducive to us essentially maintaining low interest rates in the long run because the yield curve has changed. How confident are we that 3.6% over the LTP is still an accurate figure? How long is a piece of string? Um, so uh, that 
is part of it, is part of the things. We have fixed costs that come in there for fixed interest things, but we actually have to monitor how it comes, what are the impacts, and will it, if it deeply goes up, then that is always the risk, um, that the interest rates get a bit higher than um, what we anticipated in the times that we have. Um, that long range forecast when we do the, uh, the long term plan, uh, PwC assess all of our debt, they assess when it's coming through, and then they say this is the interest rates, and within that, we also give a margin of about 0.5 over and above. So we have levers within there that we actually, yeah, this is what you said, but we put in a little bit more, but um, again, we're dictated by what, if the markets change, and they do um, unanticipated things, then that is a risk um, that rates go up higher than what we had thought. Yes. Sorry. Uh, Last question. Supplementary again. Um, so, are we monitoring this more frequently as a result of the fact that the uh, all of the indicators say that there is interest rate rises to come for at least another twelve months, possibly more? Okay. Are we mon are we the, the frequency these monthly meetings are they more frequent than they were before? Um, anything that comes to departure, then then they say that you're at risk and with things, they would notify us straight away. And so that um, doesn't change. It is on a needs basis, meaning that if it needs more, then we have more. Yes. Councillor Dowsing. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask, and it was a little bit uh, related to Sandra's question around the three waters. Um, the government's somehow benchmarked us against other councils to work out the, um, the no council work off, uh, sorry, worse, worse off. Um, payments. Do we understand that benchmarking? It must have been related to debt profiling and, and expenditure and region to point or something around those? Um, clarification on that, that's something that obviously in the better off, um, that's going to be something that we, we want to know and obviously we want to understand how they actually do the debt profile of what you're going to pay. So we are trying to be a little bit more active in that space rather than uh, reactive. Um, because we want to be able to show and demonstrate our position of what we need to do and we have a clarity stream. One of the advantages um, that we perhaps have is that we have very good records and that each of the loans, especially for the free waters, we can demonstrate it separately and we can say this is the impacts of it and we have it to the degree. But what do we actually say with other things with it? Um, so. What I'm saying is we want to get ahead of what understanding how they applied um, as opposed to a generic model that they apply because it's difficult for them to give individual aspects and reviews of councils. We want to actually say, well, this is ours. How do we actually come um, around that? And we will work uh, again with PwC um, in terms of the Treasury, but also other um, and other aspects of it as well as we get into more um, where we are forecasting things. Yeah, I think that's the thrust of my um, my question, and it's around understanding not just the um, the costs to councils, but the um, the opportunity cost of, of projects we could have done had we not focused heavily on some of these areas. For example, um, drain wise and work on um, public work on private property is a good example. As is the separation of mortuary waste um, from the Separate system, they're, they're unique projects that this council enacted at, at a cost to our community, and they come with significant reductions in services in other areas because we prioritise them. If other councils aren't doing it, it shows that we've got an opportunity cost that, that should um, come back in the form of no councils worse off. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Just, just on the three waters, I don't know if anyone else has seen, but there's actually a new ad on television opposing for um, people to be encouraged to oppose the three waters. I saw it on TV this morning. I thought, like, oh, well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a big ad, actually. Um, so does anyone know where that's funded or if there's um, been... Can we just stick to the Treasury report, my friend? Can okay. we just stick to this? We can have okay. another quarter around three waters later. Any questions in regards to our Treasury report? Okay. To Pauline, given how topical Three Waters is, and on page 150, items two, three, and four. You're on the wrong paper. Sorry. We'll get there. Thank you, Councillor Seymour. 
Seconded by Councillor Sheldrake. Any more questions in regards to our Treasury? If not, all in favour, one, three, carried. Okay, we move to our financial report. Thank you, Pauline. Do you want to have a quick chat there? And then we'll open for questions. Okay, it's probably just two things. It's only the first three months. And um, in terms of that, uh, you get some of the uh, things from the end of the year to the beginning of the year, there's cruels and the things that comes back with some board. So um, it's, we're tracking. Um, but usually first three months is um, very early in the piece to be actually uh, to say any definitive um, predictions, et cetera, with it. But we are tracking. There's no things with it. There's one other thing that I, we noticed uh, last night um, when it was loading, and I'm quite happy to put the things out there. But um, on page um, 151, um, under... 10 operation, it says commercial operations. The actual commentary that was sitting underneath that was duplicated from the commentary under number eight, reading regional leadership and support services. Um, and uh, the graphs on page 152 and on were a little bit smaller. I have got them in uh, wider, which they were supposed to be landscape. So I'm happy to put that out. But the commentary on commercial operations should have read, um, this budget is for staff and community housing um, upgrades. GHL manages this. The budget has been phased evenly over the year. Due to COVID-19 uh, response in August, there were delays with some of the ventilation materials for the work at Flitton Court. The work is now scheduled to be done in October. So quite happy to hand out these um, for, uh, for the references uh, for that, um, but my apologies, but happy to take any other uh, questions that may be in relation to the paper. Thank you. Councillor Foster. Um, just on page 146 and um, 04, um, parking fees have been adjusted to include two hours free parking and will remain in effect until we move down to level one. Um, I don't know if anyone went into town last week in the two days when it was raining, but um, I've had so many retailers come to me and complaining because there was no parks in town whatsoever. And even now, when there's no rain, the parks are just full and they're not there for people retailing, they're workers in town. And I know our, um, our parking staff are having major problems as well. Um, so, you know, I think, I think we need to review this before we go to level one, because level one, I don't think it's going to be for a while, or who knows, but I don't think we can keep this up because it is actually hurting our town quite badly. And... Um, yeah, the, the, yeah. I, when you drove, I drove through town a few times last week when it was raining, and um, it was like it was a full-on busy day. And you thought, oh, yeah, the town's pumping. And you go and talk to the retailers. They haven't had a customer in all day. They can't get a park. You know, so this is this is a this policy that we've got at the moment is detrimental to the welfare, the well-being of our um, of our CBD. I'd like to see it um, reviewed urgently, please. You want to comment? Um, yep, that can put in a particular time, and then you could put a media release um, mm -hmm. that from this particular date that is reverting because of that. Um, if that's what the major consensus is. Yeah. Any more questions in regards to our financial reporting, Councillor Seymour? Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, and thanks for your report. Just um, a few items for clarification, if you don't mind. Thanks very much. So the first one, beg your pardon. The first one is on page. Make sure I'm on the right report. Yes, um, page one fifty five. The resident satisfaction survey. I was interested to read that we're now doing four surveys a year of only one hundred people. And can someone please explain? Um, when we chose to do that, because it did seem, and I understand completely that it's not being reported on until four surveys have been done, but is, is that not a more costly way to go about it, and that we used to do one survey and was done over a given period of time and 400 people were interviewed, whereas to have piecemeal, you're not, the information not going to be consistent because what is asked for now is different in six months' time. We can, that is in the next report. Um, so we will cover um, that one. So that, 
this report finishes is on page three. Sorry, I was just okay. making sure I got quite yeah. right. Right. Moved by Councillor Dowsing, seconded by Councillor Warsnob. Any more questions from the floor? If not, all in favour, contrary carried. Okay, councillors, we now move to our financial reporting. So I have a clever plan. So I'm just gonna share my clever plan with you. On the next page, on page 55, you can see the categories there on the left top-hand side. So I have written page numbers down. So I'm gonna break it up. So first I'm going to do environmental services and protection. That's page 157 to page 164. So I'm gonna open that category now. Um, this is your time to ask some questions. Just speak up clearly because it, we can't properly hear and use your microphones. Okay, Councillor Cranston. Yeah, thank you. Um, page 163, um, the percentage of registered and licensed premises that undergo, undergo health compliance inspection annually, uh, thinking about an email we've recently received, what premises need health compliance, i.e. Uh, do accommodation providers have health standards to be monitored by council? I can answer that if you like. Is it possible? Oh, okay. Um, I am talking, sorry. Uh, so... Um, Wait a second, Helen, while we just up our volume here in the chambers. Welcome, Helen. Um, if you can just speak again so we can hear what the volume is. Thank you. Kia ora, perfect. The floor is yours, Helen. Thank you. <laughs> Kia ora. Um, yep. I did hear your question. Thank you. Uh, so they are mainly food preparation purposes. They're not um, uh, hotel accommodations, etc. Uh, we do also do um, hairdressers as well. So in the results there, it says food, health and liquor. Is that food health, is it? Or because um, the query I've got does re uh, relate to health. Um, so it, it depends on the um, the health venue, whether it's covered by the acts that we administer. So accommodation is not necessarily part of that act, um, unless it is a, a house or a dwelling. So we do sometimes um, state that a house is unsanitary for people to be in it, and it's usually about having running water. Uh, they've got running water, the trouble is it's coming down the roof, down the walls, onto the beds. <laughs> anyway, it's not so good. <laughs> I just wondered where that sat with us here. Uh, so we can um, inspect that under the Building Act, um, and if it's an unsound building, then uh, Council can address it in that way. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Warsnop, Foster. Thank you. Uh, so my first question was on page 158. Um, and just with regards to the uh, um, progress tracking to date, um, just, I guess I'm, I'm wanting to understand the level of confidence that I, I understand that this is quarter one and obviously quarter one, you know, we have a new budget for the new year and we get um, satellite all guns blazing. Um, but I also know that there's a lot of pressure still in the system and uh, how confident are we? I know most of these projections are that the full year outlook is better than the first quarter results. And I, I guess um, I just wanna understand whether or not we're being optimistic or realistic because um, I, I expect that a lot of that pressure will remain. So um, that, that's my first question and I've got another one, thanks. So in relation to the finances, obviously the more consents we have, um, the rosier that looks. Uh, but in saying that, obviously we need to use more consultants. So a lot of that is balanced out. Um, uh, in relation to the, the parking, the, the comment previously um, is, is quite accurate. Obviously um, a lack of income and in parking does um, adversely affect my area uh, quite considerably because that's where the, the income is recorded. Um, so it will it will depend on uh, how long COVID lasts and, and any decisions you might make um, in the long term about parking and charges at level two. 
Cool, thank you. I did also have a note around parking. I appreciate um, Councillor Foster for raising that. I, I agree with the general thrust of what he was saying in terms of our ability to sustain it for a long period of time. Um, so I would, I would encourage us to look further at that as well. Um, the uh, last question I've got in this area is just around, um, around the progress to plan uh, on page 160. And actually it starts on what page uh, 159. Um, and just note the different uh, progress that we've recorded in there. And um, just in light of the fact that a lot of the communication that I have at the moment is, um, is, is less about the timeframes and more about the time that is allocated um, for the proportion, I suppose, proportionality of the consent. I just wondered if that was a focus in our commitments in progress, um, just with regards to um, ensuring that if, if we're taking a lot of time on something and it's not necessarily down to the complexity of the consent, it's down to maybe something else within our systems, um, you know, how are we keeping track of that and aiming to improve it? because uh, it is something that I'm hearing a lot about at the moment. Um, and I'd really encourage that to be, uh, I guess, a, a commitment and something that we measure progress on. Um, yeah. Could I get some um, uh, response to that, please? Uh, certainly. Um, so there's two sort of things in relation to that uh, response. Um, and one is that the the time it takes to undertake an activity doesn't necessarily reflect the complexity of the considerations um, around that particular consent. So a water take, for example, um, might take someone on the ground, you know, a very short amount of time to implement. Um, but obviously the considerations uh, in relation to a, you know, a water take consider the whole catchment, um, the state of the catchment, other takes in the catchment, etc. So sometimes the consent is more complex than the actual task that's being consented. Um, and the second thing is that um, all of our processes are going to and are currently being looked at through our time frame improvement project um, to make sure that we are doing what we need to do in the most efficient way that we can for for the council in terms of its statutory protections, but also for the customer. Okay, next on my list was Councillor Foster, then Robinson, then Seymour. Thank you. Um, just on page 163 again, um, under noise control, and the front page of the paper last night was about the upper log yard and the complaints of the residents in Crawford Road, Peral Street, around the area of the noise and other issues with the upper log yard. Um, my question is that um, when and I know that there are a lot of noise complaints that come through council and we've been, you know, we're kind of in the forefront of this at the moment. So what is our response when a noise complaint comes through from that, the residents in that area? What, what is our response to that, please? Uh, so we contract out our um, initial noise response uh, to um, a local firm and they go out and they check the noise. Usually it's in relation to, you know, parties and, and things of that nature and they make judgment calls about um, noise. They have noise meters, et cetera, to, to measure volumes. It is a little bit different with the log yard um, and we work quite closely with the port in relation to um, if they have a, a spike in non-compliances in relation to their, uh, their, their noise control um, programs. Um, as you probably all are also aware, um, there's been some um, health reports generated in relation to the log noise and its effect long-term on people. Uh, and we're still working through those. Um, when we got the initial report, it needed to, we needed to have a peer review of it. Um, so we're working through that information still uh, with the port and with health. Yeah. Mr. Robinson and then Councillor Seymour, thank you. So two questions. Um, first is in relation to the two hour free parking. So what time of the day is that currently set for? Hmm? All day. It's all. Oh, I thought that. Yes. Okay. So um, the second um, one is in relation to the matter that Councillor Cranston raised um, that accommodation matter. 
Helen, I don't know if you know what we're talking about, um, and I won't go into specifics at the moment, but I'm just wondering with that particular place, because it had changed its use, would a change of use of a premises invoke a resource consent application? Helen, do you think? Uh, a change of use does not necessarily invoke a resource consent application. Um, and it depends on the scale of the change of use, whether it invokes a building consent application. Um, I'm not aware of the particular instance that you're talking about, um, but if it's raised through Heather with my departments, then um, we can see what we can do. Right. Got it. Thank you. We move on to Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Chair. Page 157, just back to... Um, supplementary to Councillor Walsnock's question, which wasn't mine, is not about financials of that level of service, but the monitoring of it. And while it notes for the moment on um, two instances on page 157, minor acceptable deviations, I'm just concerned about how we're going to monitor that. So if, if we accept at the moment with no description that it's minor acceptable deviations, how do we know that we've got better in three months' time? You know, what measure is there in place or script in place for council to understand that next in three months it's better? At the moment, that's impossible to monitor. Are you Madam Chair? Kira Helen, are you going to answer? Tim, are you going to answer? I am. Oh Helen, uh, thank you. Oh, or or I can in relation to those specific things and then and then Tim can give an overview of how the system coding system works. This is um, the building consents and the assessment for enforcement and compliance on page one five seven. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, so in relation to building consents, it's it, the minor deviation is in relation to our timeframes. Um, so if you see uh, further down in in that section. Uh, we have slipped a little on our timeframes um, in relation to building control. That's mostly in relation to um, the volume of consents that we're getting in. Um, and obviously, we still have the same amount of staff for that volume. We are using contractors um, in relation to some of those and, and working through them as quickly as we can. Um, and I believe in relation to the, uh, the monitoring area, it's in relation to a... Um, the timeliness of our response for some of our animal control call-outs. Thank you. And, oh, and um, as we sort of raised earlier, some of those inspections um, for for the health licences, but that's restricted through, through COVID lockdowns. Thank you, Madam Chair. And through you, Madam Chair, thank you for that, Ms Montgomery. I just have a couple more, and one relates, and this is page 159, um, the request for service system for stormwater on private properties and that project is to be progressed. And I would think stormwater on private properties is really um, pretty uh, relevant right now. So can we understand um, when that piece of work is going to be done? Uh, so that program of work um, is scheduled within the first 12 months of the LTP. So um, we're in the first quarter now. The You'll see the two items below it have been progressed. Um, so in the later three quarters of this year, uh, this financial year, that's when um, that project will be looked at. Thank you. And, and then I too wanted to raise, and um, um, it has been sent in, I think, as a request for service, the item that's been loosely spoken about without identifying it. And it's with respect to the, the property and the standards within it. And I'm curious, if this is getting back to 163, around health, food, health and liquor. And even if it isn't, I agree, your monitoring department and maybe it is building consents, hopefully the system will pick up that request that has been sent in and look into it. But can you please explain to me why in level two, when people can go to the hairdresser or use the facilities that we are required to monitor, why is it difficult for us to monitor? Because the exposure mm -hmm. of the public is the same as whether we're in level one or not in anything but we are not able to, it says here in the report on page 163 that lockdown has significantly, and level two has significantly impacted our ability to conduct verifications and inspections. Um, that's, I, I don't disagree with you on that one, uh, Councillor Seymour. We um, are a bit perplexed about it, but that comes directly from the Ministry um, in terms of us being allowed to undertake food verifications. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Much appreciated.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Helen, I just want to make a comment as well. If we go to page 162, it's great to see at the top there that our resource consents for the first quarter has got green boxes and it is, um, you know, our targets are 70 and 75. I know we've had lots of issues um, some in our control, some not in our control in the last while. So I just also want to congratulate your team for stepping it up. Um, it's clearly visible here with those green boxes. So also on behalf of councillors, can you please thank your team? I know there's still a lot of work to be done in that area, but um, I do want to acknowledge um, those three green traffic lights. Who thank you, Your Worship. We are pretty proud about that too. <laughs> Isaac. Oh, kind of further to that, but on the building consent side, so it does have first quarter here, but I thought it would be interesting to have put, uh, quarter three and four from last year. <coughs> Massive improvement on that from memory. I think yep. it was in the 60s, so um, well done for that as well. And then just around further to Pat's point around the um, health and compliance, where does that sit if we move to the traffic light system? Like, have we got capacity in house to catch those figures up? Um, I believe that we do. At the moment, we're um, undertaking some of the other work that's required. So our follow-ups on inspections that have um, been undertaken. Um, so obviously that, that follow-up won't be happening um, when we are allowed to go out and inspect again. So um, that they are still working at capacity even though they're not undertaking inspections. So um, I'm confident that we'll be able to get through the inspections that we need to, provided lockdown finishes. Um, <laughs> relatively soon. Otherwise, um, we will be playing catch up next year as well. Thank you for that, Helen. I think now we're going to move to our next section and then we'll have a coffee after that. So our next section is page 165 to 169, which talks about land, rivers and coastal. Yes. Who is going to be Mr. Wilson? I can see you behind your mask. So councillors, I'm just opening up one 65, if you don't have questions, that's fine. Just flag that I carry on. But I do want to give everyone the opportunity if they have a query, just to lay it out there and get an answer. Okay, Councillor Warsnop. And then we're gonna have a coffee before road. Second to track down my things. Um, can you just tell me what page you were going to? 160, we are going to page 169. Between, uh, 165 up. to 169. Okay. So, we're all so one, um, 167, it was just around um, the stormwater system and the fact that obviously there's a lot of commentary on um, where we put our new developments, etc. Um, am I I'm on one, 167? Is that right? Um, how do we review our role, I guess, or, or how do, what happens after the likes of this great big um, deluge? And um, how does that fit into this kind of monitoring? Where we Do we go back and review um, how the systems that we've put in, how the infrastructure that we've put in holds up and use that information for future planning? Just a question around how we, um, how we utilize events like this. Your Worship. With any heavy rain event, we go out while it's happening and afterwards to look at where water levels have gotten to. Are we surprised by any levels? Um, I'll be honest with you, we Sponge Bay worked exactly as it was designed to. It did exactly what we expected it to do. It was just a lot of water. Um, so with our flood control schemes, we had our staff out monitoring levels across the whole of the district. So we've been looking at seeing where things were. We have got areas for improvements for those go into our operations. When it comes to flood levels, there is a lot of surveys that happen now. And um, there's a lot of work, uh, Murray Cave, um, Ian Petty, those teams will now be going out looking at a whole lot of things that we have seen. Um, there's a number of active sites under investigation. Those will then come back and we'll see if there's anything we want to change with what we're doing. Council Faulkner. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, a question again for uh, Mr. Wilson. Um, I note on page 166, uh, capital expenditure year to date slightly under mm -hmm. for the revetments on Taraheru and Tūrunganui rivers. Um, my question was around uh, 
what are we budgeting there for? Are we budgeting for repairs or indeed enhancement of the existing revetments? Because I would argue that uh, building higher and higher walls on particularly the Tarahiro, which desperately needs draining uh, or, or allowing to clear itself, um, is probably not a very smart use of our money. Through your worship, the works that are happening on the Tarahiro now are works that were carried forward. We had some extra budget available, we'd come in under budget. So we decided to move the money to replace a 60 meter section that has failed along where you can see the works that are happening just across from the building here. So that section had failed and was falling in. With the replacements that we're doing, we're coming back to the heights um, that are there now. We've raised it slightly um, around, and that's more in response to climate change and rising sea levels. There is a separate project that is underway within council around the um, hydrology of the Tarihiru and whether or not there is an option to remove some of the Spartina grasses that are there, but then also just around the silt levels that are coming up within the Tarihiru. As you can imagine, that's quite complex within that ecosystem and the environmental um, considerations that need to be taken as part of that. So that project has just been working through a lot of those. Okay, let's have a coffee. We will come back at quarter past 10 for roads and footpaths. Just use your microphone, please. There's no mention of the Waipa River here, and I know there's work being done. And very good work by way of planting. But the issue for me <coughs> is that those dollars are sitting there now. We're in our eighth year. They were originally designed and designated and paid for by a loan, <coughs> the wider community around Rutherford. And they should be in the river doing what they designed for. So, what's going to happen there? Through your worship, the installation of the dollars sits with the Waipu catchment plan and for what is going to be done, where they go as part of the catchment planning process. So whilst the loan is being paid back for the purchase of the dollars, there's no funding to put those dollars into the river at this stage. That's not in any of the budgets that are there. The dollars installation sits around um, whatever the outcome of the Waipu catchment plan and where that process is best telling us where those should go. Coffee time.
Okay, we move to page 170 to 177. That's our roads and footpaths. And before we dig into that, I just want to acknowledge Dave and his team at Civil Defence for the job they've done in the last few days, trying to keep our roads open. I know we'll probably see a lot of damage from this event, which will come to us. But Dave, I just want to acknowledge um, the work your Civil Defence team. So please pass it on to Ben and all, everyone that was involved. Okay, questions? Councillor Cranston. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, page 174, uh, Taruhia River Cycleway. Uh, stage one point of entry acceptance has been approved. What exactly has been approved? So through you, Your Worship, the funding that's come from Waka Portahi is contingent on a business case and some of the costings being approved before we're able to draw down the next um, level. So a point of entry means that it's in TO, which is our transport um, investment online with Waka Portahi. And if it's not within TO, then it, it doesn't exist. So the point of entry means they've accepted it for consideration for the next steps going forward with them. We've been asking what the next steps are, given that it's funded locally and that we want to crack on and move with it. However, also acknowledging that we need to get our resource consents and our detailed design and costings done. So it's around that part of it has been pressed go to go on to the next stage for construction. That's still in progress. Yeah, cool. And I've got another one. Um, the next page, actually. It's the Crawford Road. I see it's like coming to completion there. Just a couple of issues with that. I've been using it quite a bit lately. I'm off on a bike trip on Saturday, so I'm trying to get legs on. Um, it's quite problematic. There's so much parking in that lane, and some of the parking, you actually can't get past them, so you've got to come back into the road. So, you know, it's a bit of a concern that they're just using it as a parking space. And it kind of, it's kind of losing its attractiveness because of that. And the other thing, which is probably too late now, but I find frustrating is the entry point coming from uh, Wainui, where you come onto it, you cross the road, you drive past one and a half ounces, and then you cross the road back again. It just seems a, sort of a strange design to me. But that's, that's by the way, the main thing I do is the, the parking on it and the usability. So through your worship, we've been working with the residents around those that continue to park within the cycleway and they, the next step is enforcement. We've tried with education. So once it's completed, they know that we will now move to enforcement and that will be the next steps going forward. So working with Ross and his team about how they're going to enforce that going forward. Yeah, I'm sure it would be good if we didn't have to go to the enforcement level, but it has been going on for a while now. So, yeah. Any other questions? Councillor Farehanger, thank you. Um, just, just to clarify in regards to the um, Crawford Road resident stuff, is, is it correct that they're, they're parking there is permissive until the work is done around the driveways and things like that too? So I thought that that was the agreement with the residents. So through your worship, we had conversations with the residents affected by the driveways being done and the fact that Fulton Hogan was still parking their vehicles while the works were underway within the cycleway. So there was a, an agreement they could do it for then while they were in there working. However, it's on weekends and outside of those hours that we're having a few issues, which we're just working through before we come through with tickets and things like that. I had Councillor Walsnop next and then Councillor Seymour. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I um, on page one seventy six, just with regards to how we're tracking um, our levels of service, and I note that we have end of year targets. Um, and I mean, uh, I appreciate the fact that we we are um, we are tracking the response to levels of service. Um, I think it, I would love to see a little bit more granularity in that. What is um, you know, what does 60% actually mean? Uh, how many outstanding levels of service have we got now relative to before we, uh, or quarter three or whatever? Um, just in terms of the fact that it, it, we've got it in here as a priority because it's something that we get so much feedback about. Um, it's obviously related to the time of the year to a certain extent and where we are in our budget cycle and our work plans and all that kind of stuff. But um, because it's something that I really hope the new contracts have a huge amount of emphasis on, I want to see more information so that I can say, hey, look, yeah, we're, we're nailing this. We're actually making some headway. Um, it's, it's still quite hard to see 
in these headline figures um, what progress is being made at, at, at a deeper level. Um, and just with regards to road condition and road maintenance, um, having end of year targets, given we know how quickly our roads deteriorate, um, potentially it is, you know, for us, it'll be way too late for us to do anything about it when we get behind again. So is it, is it wise to have end of year targets rather than um, tracking the quarterly condition? Um, yeah, that's, that's my concern here. So through your worship, these are the performance measures that are in our annual plan and in our LTP that we respond to. So the one around requests for service is the contractor's ability to respond within the timeframes that we have got set in our team. So it's a timeframe thing. Whether or not the request for service has been completed or was completed within the time frame is a separate measure. So this is around the response for when the RFS first comes in that they need to have gotten back to them within that time frame. So that's the measure there. The, there is further reporting, but this is the measure that's included in this part of it. The road condition scoring, and that's around cost to do that quarterly is actually quite expensive because we have to get it done um, independently. So we line that with the time that Waka Kota, he does theirs so that we're getting it done at the same time rather than paying for it four times a year for it. Sorry, just supplementary. Um, I wonder if we have really, and obviously it's too late if we've set it in our LTP, but I wonder if we have the wrong measure then in, res in regards to the response to request for service, because it's very simple to say, hey, yeah, I've got your RFS. That doesn't tell us anything about their actual responsiveness, and that's the responsiveness that I care about. So we have metrics around our response times to request that are within the time frame and the percentage of requests that are completed within the time frame that comes in a different report than this one. Councillor Seymour. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, through you, Mr. Wilson. While I appreciate that um, this is on emergency work on the bottom of 173, and while it's a, a large sum of money and a cumulative report, could I just put a plug in for the Pippa Aro Road out of um, Waipero Bay, which mm -hmm. is having some work, has had some work done after months following um, the storm event of Queen's birthday weekend, and was substantially damaged again last week, and does prevent real frustration for people. So where can we see, um, and I don't think it even happens to um, our road transport committee, a schedule of what that emergency 16 million is likely to be spent on for this year, please. So through your worship, the tender packages for that are released on the 14th of this month. So they go out to the market on the 14th with all of the roads. We've been going back through, the funding was approved at your last council meeting. So we've now got the tender packages about to be released now that we've got funding. We've been through and done the verification. Paul Gordor is in there. Um, it was one that we needed the funding for. It's a significant piece of work, that one. So we have the schedules um, ready to go, the tender documents. I'm happy if you want those to come back for an RTC or we can just email you out the list. Actually, might be better. We'll just email you the list, the tenders, no problem. And then I just had one further question, Madam Chair, with respect yep. to the walking and cycling at Uawa Cycleway. And I just wondered, I understand that community meetings are happening at level one from a conversation I had with the Chief Executive, but we are now starting to talk about this and write about it. And I don't think all Oh, I'm sure a full meeting with the community has been advertised so that the public can pull out. Um, they've done various pieces of consultation for themselves, haven't they? We'll get inside the group, but it would be good to take that information to the community as a whole. So, can we have a commitment to that once we get into level one, please? So, you wish, I understand that that is in the program to meet with the community once we're able to. Good, our councillor. Meredith Akwa Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> David. Uh, one of the um, awesome. um, one of the um, requests from ratepayers to me is uh, what, when they're having damage to their vehicles uh, upon hitting a pothole. Um, with all due respect, I've been having to pay for that. But um, just priorities wise to the network, um, this is a pothole in Makaraka, um, Parker Lane. 
I've got the photo sent to me, et cetera. But I just wondered, um, that's been a couple of um, messages sent to me, and I've, of course, said that's a request for service, uh, you know, move that into that space so that it can be followed up. But I just thought, in regards to safety around the network, when we have had a considerable rain that's caused Pothole um, City, <laughs> um, how do we mitigate, I guess, in safety terms, but also allay people's um, frustration when their suspension or a tyre blows out uh, because they've hit a pothole, uh, because they didn't see respect to the weather conditions, etc. I mean, everyone has to learn to drive to the conditions and all of that, but that's been a couple of um, mentions. With all, I'm pretty sure we're not just going to start paying for people's damaged vehicles. Are we going to be funding for that? I'm sure. But that's a concern with regard to when we do see a, a, a large uh, grouping of potholes within region on the network that is used quite significantly. So through your worship, the latest rain event we have got down are bringing us a revised list of all of the unsafe potholes across the network that we will then look to see what we can fund, which we will come back to council for for further funding if we haven't got it from existing budgets. So the first priority in any rain event is to make it safe, and that's where we'll have road cones out and we'll lower the speed around it. A lot of people had, um, we know that, sorry, there are a number of people that did hit potholes that during the latest rain event because the road, um, State Highway did as well. They both deteriorated quite quickly, just given the volume of water. It's why we plead with the community to drive to the conditions and slow down when we have rain events like this. And I keep saying it every day, even now, it's, even though the sun's out, because things are still moving. So it is really people need to drive to the conditions. They need to drive slowly. Unfortunately, we do not pay for repairs to people's cars if they had a pothole or if those sort of things. That's not something that council will do. And I guess for me, do we need to do a bit of a comms to the community <laughs> to remind them of that? Because you're right, you do a lot of speaking around safety on the network, et cetera. And I know after a storm event, everyone's cleaning up, uh, fixing up and doing the best they can in the conditions. Um, but yeah, that's just this last couple of days. Kia ora. Okay, councillors, are we ready to move on from roads? I take us right into solid waste, 178 to 182. Councillor Cranston. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, we had a really good workshop last week and it identified Paukahi as the second worst emitter in the area. And when I look at the report on Paukahi on page 180, um, the package planned is leachate collection, leachate storage, surface water drainage and riparian planting. But um, something that we did discuss at that workshop was um, either flaring of methane or using methane as a second use as another use. So is that part of the uh, investigations of that? Because it seems like that's where the, there's real problem area there. And it's not about containment, it's about getting rid of methane. Through, through your worship, one of the issues we have with Paukaho for gas collection is that it's not lined above or below. And with gas collection, you need to put it in as you fill the landfill to be able to capture and get the pockets out of it. So with an unlined landfill like Paukahu, it will be leaching the methane out of it from all areas. It won't necessarily be coming out of um, pipes or things like you do with an engineered landfill. It's something we have on a number of our closed landfills and the way that they were designed back then was for the methane to just escape naturally as it found its way out. So it wouldn't be something that we'd be able to do. Um, so it can be done, but it's not something that we'd be looking to do. Um, it's quite expensive and it's quite dangerous to do as well. Okay, Councillor Dowsing is next, then Councillor Faulkner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's one part of, the, of this piece of report that I wanted to focus on, and it's um, specifically around our level of service for um, waste minimisation. Um, you'll see on page 182 in the um, second to last box that our target is 285 kg uh, per resident in region. Um, it's been 285 kg this year, it's 285 kg last year, it's 285 kg the year before. It's um, still 30, 70 split on recycling. Um, that's not waste minimization. Uh, we aren't hitting those targets. We're not, um, we don't have an active plan in place to minimize it to those targets. So uh, my challenge here is put some realistic targets in place, first of all. Um, let's put some minimization goals that we're actually going to 
put that we're going to put a work plan in place to try to achieve. Um, what I don't see here, for example, is what is the um, industrial contribution versus the community contribution via our uh, via our black bag pickup. Um, what is the approach to uh, separating out um, business users? For example, I've been in that uh, transfer station and seen um, pub owners come in with trailer loads of bottles uh, and dump trailer loads of bottles directly into the landfill uh, because it's easier than trying to carry those that trailer load of bottles up to the separating uh, section. Uh, I've seen IT suppliers come in with band loads full of cardboard boxes and push them out into the back of the into the land, into the landfill waste. These aren't these aren't difficult things to to uh, to solve. It's accessibility to the to an area to dump them. Uh, so I uh, yeah I, I cannot go on for another year and see a target that's just sitting static. And not actually, um, and not have the conversation around: Are we actually going to try to give some teeth to our waste minimization? So I challenge staff to tell me what we've got in scope right now that would see us meet that figure. Um, and if we don't have something in scope, then let's put a working group together and work together and come up with some ideas, because we have made a con uh, we had made a. a, a uh, statement in our long-term plan that we will put more um, energy and finances into this. Uh, so yeah, I think that, I think it's a time to, um, to actually action that. Thank you. To your worship, I'm happy to bring a paper to the operations committee, which is where solid waste does its operational things too. So more than happy to bring a report to the next ops around what the waste team have got planned for this year, coming up this financial year and the timings for the review of the waste management and minimization plan. Sounds like a good plan. I had Sandra Faulkner, then Pat, on my list. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Wilson, uh, following on from um, Councillor Dowsing's question or, or request just now, I come back to our long-term plan commitments around um, developing a region-wide resource recovery enterprise. And yeah, you know, we've, we've awarded uh, a contract. There's no time frame against it. There's nothing there that we're able to actually hold anyone to um, as councillors. So um, yeah, I, I, I look at this from a um, land-based business uh, point of view. And, and I know that there are efforts to try and minimize waste in those areas, but there's very little opportunity here in town to do any of that. And, and I just wonder whether we're being, I, I just feel like we're being held to ransom a wee bit by a, an easy option of let's just ship it off out of the district. So through your worship, the feasibility report into a resource recovery center is, does have hard targets against it that civil assist are working to. I'm happy to bring those things to an operational committee. The other thing that will be coming to ops early next year is the waste contracts going forward and they are up. So it's around how we're going to tender those. What sort of service do you want? Um, do you want to carry on with the bags? You want to go to three bin wheel, wheelie bin collection? That's all starts next year. So as part of that, there's obviously cost implications. There's different levels of service, but that's coming to operations early. And I think it's the first one next year they're tracking to, to bring you the report on what's happening with those. Okay, are we happy to slide to urban stormwater? Oh, Pat, and then we go to wastewater. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask about the Pukahu landfill um, too, and I'm sorry, but I think it must have been during the rain event that I wasn't here at that um, workshop in the latter part of the day. But my note to myself and to us as a council, could we please have a full project report on Pukahu? Because Honestly, it would be six or eight years ago that we first understood that there were some issues with the remediation of Pokaho. So, and I know that we are working with um, kind of general for whom that is in their role. But I just think it is a significant project that has been around in this council for quite a long time. So, could we like the other suggestion that Mr. Wilson has made? But that could we move this along by having it as an item on our agenda at operations and truly understand 
what exactly are the options, when it's going to happen, and what if anything is holding up the process? Because we're going to have other um, items of landfills that we're going to remediate. We're going to talk about another one later, or transfer station. We can't take this long on quite significant pieces of work like that. And I'm also with Councillor Dowsing on how can we look at, and we used to have a lot of effort made on um, waste minimisation, and we had the um, sink disposal place that kids used to be taken to um, in Awapuni Road, and a, real, a lot of education was put into minimising waste. And many other um, towns actually have formalised and run by charities a um, reuse um, centre. And I know that comes at a cost, but we must be able to obtain some of that support from our levy that we pay on waste um, that goes to landfill, which has gone up in the last couple of years. So I just think we need to look at the whole issue of waste minimisation and what options there are for recycling within waste minimisation. If it's a great big shed where, project, where material is contained that then gets purchased and it is run by a charity, well, that's great. So I think that there is some work that we could do on both those projects and the clients, please. Through your worship, I'm happy to bring something to Paukahu to operations as well to talk through what we're doing there. When it comes to waste minimisation, the team is still doing the work. There is still the Rethink Centre has merged with the Tairawhiri um, Environment Centre. So TEC undertake a lot of that work on behalf of us. So do Envira Schools. So there is a whole heap of work that's happening. We've been doing it differently, so I'm more than happy to bring it and show you what we have been doing. I'm going to bring you a full report and get the team to present what they do and how they do it. Thank you. And just supplementary, with, this is on page 182 around um, the, the increased volume of legal dumping in front of the transfer station. Do we have cameras on the exterior of the transfer station? Three worship, we have cameras there. We also have a number of mobile cameras that we now have as well that we've deployed across the region for fly tipping hotspots. So, if we have cameras outside the, um, the transfer station, and I mean this one in Gisborne, which I think is what's referred to, do we follow up then, or does someone follow up with people that leave stuff outside that shouldn't be left outside? With Three worship, where we can, we hand it over to the enforcement team. Does that mean it does get followed up or? Yes. Thank you. I personally reported someone because I spy. I saw someone <laughs> dumping stuff and I did report it to our team and there was proper follow up and the people were, con they just kept me in the loop because I, I reported that, but it was people that dump and they thought no one saw them but I was out running and um, the, the, the team did follow up um, until there was some action there so yep I can personally um, report that okay Councillor Akwata Brown then we move to sorry I know we've spent a bit of time in this space so just quickly I just received this wonderful email that started hi young lady always like it when I get called a young lady but anyway um, I spent a half day with Mr Jukes and I wanted to know um, Mr Wilson I understand staff have been down to his um, space and yard and to talk with him etc etc so I just want to say thank you because it seems like he's been coming at, at council um, to discuss this issue and his letter that he sent to me was actually from 2007 um, with regard to uh, waste minimisation and actions as such. So I know we've got some long-term um, advocates and people that have worked tirelessly in this space. Are they part of that team uh, that you talk of as far as that report? Because um, I guess it's expertise and you're in a relationship there. But um, I just wanted to say, you know, that I'm, I'm quite keen to, um, to work out because we've had in the past also uh, waste uh, people who have come in with their waste the energy construct um, for this region as well. But I just wondered, uh, is, is Mr. Jukes involved uh, with respect to the projects plans for waste? waste? I have a number of conversations with Mr. Jukes on a number of different things. Um, for us going forward, the Jukes family are well aware of what we're trying to do in the waste space. There are a number of different suppliers that we talk to around different waste opportunities. Um, when I'm talking about what we're planning, I'm talking about our internal teams. This is Phil Nickerson and his team around the procurement, which is what we're going out to, hence why I'm being guarded about what we're going out with, but then also the work program is our internal work program that we do. Thank you. And I just finally, um, I know that for a large uh, 
portion of our public with the fly tipping uh, respect to uh, is around uh, poverty issues to, to the space. So in the report, do we have data uh, giving some sort of sense of who, who is struggling, I guess, with their waste in region and particularly those who do come from low-income families? Uh, I don't want to point it at them as such because when poor people can be naughty with waste, I'm sure, at some time in their lives. But just do we have data that gives us some indicators who's perhaps struggling the most uh, to, to uh, repurpose resource or um, do, do better with waste? Uh, through worship, I'll have to check with Chloe and the team if they're doing metrics on who's doing it. Okay, councillors, we slide into page 183 to 189. That's our wastewater paper. I see no hands. Then I'm going to slide to page 190 to 194, which is urban stormwater, which we've had heaps of in the last week. Um, and we can include water supply 195 to 202. Any queries in those categories? Quick, quick. yep. Uh, my question was just around now that the scales are closed. Uh, we are obviously resuming our testing for COVID in the water and how long would it be till you would expect some results back? Uh, three of worship, we only take the samples on behalf of Ministry of Health. So we took it on Sunday anyway, as per our scheduled time to take it. Um, the scales closed yesterday. I think another test will be taken either today or tomorrow. So we have to so wait to see. straight to the Ministry of Health who then release that data. Okay, Mr. Wills. I might ask a clarification, um, not about the last sentence you said, Madam Chair, but with respect to uh, the scales being open, that they're not taking samples, but they weren't all. They did take, he said. Yes, I knew that, but when I asked you several days ago, I just want to clarify all of the scales went open. There was two, weren't there? Uh, through your worship, we ended up opening most of the scales. How many? Most. Uh, most of them. Because I was just curious why there wasn't still some some, some water and waste in the system that couldn't be tested. So three worship, when we open the scours, that's predominantly from anything on the wrong side of the river from Bank Street has difficulty getting to the plant because the scours are open, so we're no longer pumping from the pump stations across the rivers. The city still goes there, Albin still goes there. Um, there's a large number of water. There's still more than 400 litres a second going in there, so we're still over capacity. So we definitely um, kept taking all of our sampling, but we have to for our consent. So the auto sampler was carrying on taking all the samples. We should. Thank you. That's what I'm Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Yep. Mr. Wilson, I'm not sure if you're aware of the situation with one particular resident um, in Balance Street towards the Stout Street end who had raw sewage coming up through their kitchen sink situation. Um, was that just an absolute anomaly because of the weather situation? Did something fail in that area that resulted in that? And is that something that he and that family could expect again if we had weather like that? So through your worship, the system was completely and utterly, utterly inundated. We were pumping everything we could. Um, it was just simply down to the sheer volume of rain that we had. We have a number of properties that Fort Hogan have been out to clean any remnants and disinfect on those. So we have been working back through that with residents. I just saw a hand. Was it Councillor Foster and then Councillor Faulkner? Thank you. Yeah, just going back to the testing of the, of the wastewater for COVID, I believe that we can test from our pump stations as well. So my you know, we've got 26 pump stations, I guess. But my question is, can you know, if we did have COVID in the system, can we actually um, test down and go per area and figure out what area the COVID's coming from, from those um, pump stations? We can, however, we have our auto sampler, which is at Bank Street. That is the most accurate place to take it from. We worked with MOH. We can go back up into the pipes if we need to, like they have in other areas, but it's an operational thing. Yeah. Councillor Faulkner. Thank you. This was a, um, a slightly more general question um, around the rain event that we've just had, Ms. Wilson, and 
uh, your level of comfort with the current budget for stormwater within the city? Um, has it has it placed it like a Sometimes these things serve to focus one's attention and um, you know, it's kind of easy in peacetime to agree to a whole bunch of stuff, but does, has this at all focused where we should be spending more things that we should be looking at? I appreciate a lot of that's operational, but in this situation, you still got to have the dollars to, to do the operations, so yeah. Your Worship, you've just set the budgets for the LTP. We gave our advice up in our asset management plans of where we thought the budgets would be needed for the three waters going forward. So the asset management plans obviously had asked for more funding than what we were able to do through the LTP. We can work with the budgets that we've got. Um, there is obviously a need to invest more across the district in our wastewater stormwater, but it also has to be affordable with everything else that we've got going on in the community. So. We can deliver the budgets that we've got in front of us. There's tweaks that we will start to make to the system now that from the lessons learned from this, but it took 95 mils of rain before we were able to tip over. Councillors may remember 50, 60 mils of rain we would tip over. 95 mils within the time period we had it was a new record for what we could take. So we're now learning from that, making tweaks to pump stations and inlet flows. So there's always things that we can do within the existing budgets as well. Okay, did I see a wave from you, Mr. Bedette? Question to David, and mine is reinforced what Sandra has said. David, in terms of our drive brain wise program, could we not crank it up and be more effective? I know it requires resources, but otherwise, we're, we're in this game for a long term. So through your worship, we have been issued our consent for our wastewater and stormwater discharges. So that has just been issued. It hasn't been through its appeal process yet. So we need to wait for that to be finalized. There are budgetary considerations that we will need to come back and bring back to council because there are new requirements on us that we'll have to meet in our consent. Okay, I am going to open us. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I'm going to, Michelle, we're moving to your next category. You've got a microphone there next to you. Kia ora. We live, no, I'm still in livable community. Oh, yeah, no, you are livable communities. Catchments, biodiversity, cultural activities, recreation, and amenity. So that's page seven pages, page 203 to 211. Councillors, any queries or questions in regards to that category? We'll just give Michelle some time to get here. Kia ora, welcome. Okay, Councillor Walsnop. Thank you. you uh, I've just got one question and it relates kind of to uh, tomorrow's paper a little bit. Um, unfortunately, I'm not here and I just note that uh, once again, the Natural Heritage Fund has been hugely popular. Um, and just uh, on page 209, we talk here about, um, uh, about progress and grant approvals, um, encouraging landowners to use the emissions trading scheme uh, with regards to 3A um, overlay land. And um, just, uh, I guess, the, the challenge really is that a lot of that land is not eligible for the ETS because it had some kind of vegetation, even if it was just fern back in 89. So are we able, because that limits obviously how we can access any grant funding, um, are we able to look perhaps wider at um, perhaps a bulk application to um, the Jobs for Nature Fund or something that we'd, um, that we'd use to replace the erosion control funding scheme? Because at the moment, it, there's, it's, 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 much, um, it's much harder than just signing into the ATS. To, for, for landowners to, to do anything outside of the Natural Heritage Fund, um, is there an opportunity for us to do that? So through you, Your Worship. So your, your question is whether we can look into alternative funds for land overlay 3A type um, areas where they might not qualify for. Uh, my understanding is that we, we are looking at alternative funds. Um, already, but uh, if Joe has anything to add to that with um, particularly the One Billion Trees um, work. Good, Joe. 
um, through you, Chair, not at this time. Um, the funding, um, I suppose, network or environment changes all the time, especially from central government. So we're keeping a close eye on those funding opportunities and obviously we'll look to leverage them both for ourselves and the wider community where we can. We are looking at what is becoming available, um, but in terms of it, um, right now, um, no. Sorry, just um, for, yeah, for clarity. So there's currently land that's not eligible for the ETS. We don't have the erosion control funding scheme for any new areas. And we also have areas that are prone to erosion that are not 3A overlay that we also want treated. And at the moment, there's not, there's not much that council's doing outside of the natural heritage fund or that we can do um, because the ETS, we can help facilitate that. But if that land's not eligible, you don't have any options. So um, yeah, that, that's essentially the thing that I'm trying to highlight is that if something does have to come up to, to Joe's point, it is quite urgently needed um, because uh, otherwise you're just not going to get that land treated um, because it's prohibitively expensive to do it without um, a mechanism to help fund it. Kerry, did you want to add to that? Did you have some further insights that you might be able to share? Uh, yes, thank you, Michelle. And um, through the mayor, just um, what we're actually referring to there as well, Councillor Warsnop, is there are still some outstanding grants that have been approved for the ECFP, and they've been hard to get underway, but the ECFP and the ETS apply together so they can claim what outstanding ECFPs are available. There's a, still a substantial amount of them around. So that grant money is still available and the ETS is available as well. So you can get both. And so we're working on that on quite a few properties at the moment. So that's the short term, there's funding to do that. And it's quite a bit of work to get that moving. And I think we could be quite successful in, in getting, getting that moving along. Until now, some landowners have had ECFP funding and that has not been sufficient to, to cover the costs with the ETS, but I think both together, that's changed things significantly. So we've got quite a bit of ground that is eligible for the ETS, it's, it's still bare. And so we're working on areas where landowners can get both of the money. Okay, I think Councillor Seymour was next, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the report. And I mean, the issue of grants being made and landowners not undertaking the work has always been a, a historical aspect of that project. So council staff would be congratulated for putting some time into encouraging landowners. But I'd also have to say that as part of our own landowner management, that we should be expected to plant a few poles and pop the envelopes ourselves and not expect them to be funded externally. I mean, that is about conservation on our own properties. I'd just like to um, talk about the number of work plans and then the number of properties where a farm environment plan isn't on a check. There's a farm environment plan and PMA is discussed because at the minute, for everyone's benefit, not all farms have to have a farm environment plan. And so it's a bit misleading if we think we've got 40, um, there's more than 40 farms in there. So it would be good if we could identify how many properties fall into the category that are obligated to have a farm plan by when because that's a useful tool to understand how, how we are making progress. And then again, with respect to the PMAs, if we could understand roughly how many properties have got PMAs on, because we have that data, and that we're going to monitor 50 in one year, because again, there'd be hundreds that have got PMAs. And it just makes the reporting a bit more meaningful, because I guess for those who aren't involved in the land, to understand that only 40 farms across the district require a farm plan probably looks like you know, thousands are being let off the hook. So we actually just need to understand there's a time frame about when um, farm environment plans need to be in place and that they when they need to be certified from council. So I just think that would be helpful to make the reporting more meaningful. Thanks very much. Thanks. Councillor Boutet. Chair, in terms of government requirement, that we, the council, have to undertake identification of SNAs, where are we with that? 
So I threw you your worship. <laughs> so that sits with um, strategy and science. So we're still waiting for the national policy statement on indigenous biodiversity to be finalized. That's the document that sets out the requirements for SNAs and their identification. Um, the latest update we have, we're expecting it next year, but um, we'll update you as soon as we know. Um, if they stick to the current timeframes, there's quite a long time period that they've given to councils to do that assessment process and incorporate the information into their plans. So it would sit within phase two of the TRMP review as, as the status currently stands, but, but it's not been finalized yet. So Beth, I just wanted to, uh, through you, Madam Chair, SNAs is going to have an identification and the impact, wider impact on our whole community is going to have a huge, <clears throat> be of huge concern to all of us. So we need some clarity around it. Thank you. Good, uh, Councillor Farahinga, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to um, ask a question in regards to page 206, um, cultural activities. It's actually about something that's not on there that I think well, that I wanted to ask maybe why it's not, or maybe it's just been omitted. It's around uh, Hawaii Tūrana. Um, I don't need an update or anything like that, but um, I'm wondering if Hawaii Tūrana needs to also be included in regards to these cultural activities about reporting in terms of financing. Um, we wish it the, that's not our project, so um, we will be reporting on we are supporting them, but in terms of timeframes and accountability, that's not our project. Okay, any other questions? Then we move on. Thank you, Michelle. We now have the special hot seat for Mr. Beatty. Last but not least, Mr. Beatty, page 212 to 230, we're going to cover regional leadership and support services. And then we will move to our last report. Welcome. Page 212, councillors, the floor is yours. Mr. Baker, if you wanted to give a quick update before we ask a few questions. I was just going to say very quickly that this is a bit of a catch-all category, as I'm sure yes. you can see from the, the, the yes. paper itself. So um, where questions sit squarely in my space, I'm happy to answer those and might farm out others. Thank you. Here we go. Councillor Warsnob. Um, I first of all just want to congratulate who came, ever came up with the um, uh, engagement calendar tool on page 223. I think that's an awesome idea, um, not only for ourselves, but also for anyone who wants to keep tabs on what's coming up. I think that's a really good initiative. I'm ready to see it, very supportive of that. Um, can't wait to see it rolled out. Um, and just my only other note was on page 224, our 40% of people who think we're making good decisions. Um, and obviously that's not a great result, result. And maybe 100 residents isn't a great sample size, but I, I would still be interested in understanding the rationale that those 100 residents gave. Just um, if we're gonna sample them, we might as well try and understand where they're coming from. Um, do we have any further information on that? Who wants to talk to that? Hands up. Either. Yes, we do, and I can get it to you. I think, sorry, if I may, too, for your worship, well, this is one of the um, issues that we were discussing around the resident satisfaction survey that wasn't picked up with response to Councillor Seymour. So if we could also go to um, Tim to just provide that response. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Uh, sorry, your worship. Um, yeah, this sort of refers to the question that I believe Councillor Seymour sort of um, asked in the previous paper. Um, so with the, we took the opportunity um, through the new long-term plan to have a look at the, the resident perception survey that we do. And we realized that the, the process that we've had, which is taking a sample size of 100 people every quarter, doesn't really give you statistically reliable data. There's a margin of error of maybe 10 to 15% when you're only sampling a size that small. 
So being able to provide clear commentary on the reason why something may have gone up or down by a significant level is quite difficult when you're looking at such a small sample size because it can be quite fickle results. Whereas once you collate those to a sample size of 400, you've got, you've got a margin of error of around 5%. So that's statistically robust data. So we can report on that and give real clarity at an annual level. Whereas when, you, um, when you're down at 100, it, it can be quite fluid and it can be very hard for us to sort of explain exactly why because it's dependent on the specific people that you that you've sampled so you get a better sense of the commentary over the course of a year um, than you do on a, on a quarterly basis so with that particular one it, it, it can be quite difficult to determine exactly why the perception of council's decision making ability has dropped or increase as the case may be in inside one quarter and then the other thing is as well of course if you if you do it you sample it quarterly but then you collate it annually you then guard yourself against the possibility that if you just did it all in one hit if there's something very recent one particular decision that may council may have been made that may have been unpopular that could color the data that you get so if you sample it over the over the year and then collate it you get a better sense of how people are shifting and moving but you get a big enough sample size if that's not too complicated good any more questions oh it's councillor dowsing thank you um thank you yes i wanted to question the value of the, the survey in general currently being at 0.02 percent of our community uh sample size um and um and highly targeted to um to specific demographics by nature of it being a um, a landline phone based survey uh, means that we're actually also limiting that 0.02% to a specific segment of society. Uh, does that not throw a margin of error out even further? And then when you collate that yeah, quarterly, only getting up to 0 0.08, but still from a targeted demographic, is that still not throwing it completely off? There is some methodology that they use around that. So even within that each set of 100, they do target a full range of the demographic so they try to make sure that there is a a, a split on gender ethnicity age it can be harder to do that obviously with <laughs> with the methodology they use being primarily landline it can be hard it takes them quite a long time to get down to the, those groups of it's people. not primarily landline it's solely landline is it not i think there is a, is there a mobile there is a mobile component i'm not sure the exact percentage yeah but it, i must admit that look it's something that that we are we are looking to review because i think relying on your measures being solely on perception of server uh, perception there is some issues with that particularly around service usage because people are asked about services they may or may not necessarily use and so they might say what's your perception of the pool oh i don't like it but they haven't been in 10 years so so i, so I think there's i guess the final part the, the thrust of my question is really is there value in doing it because it seems like a wasted effort to me it's data that i don't rely on it's data that i see but don't but but don't necessarily read because it's just too it's too biased on current uh, on current climate and it's also um, too small a sample in my opinion and and as far as I know it's always been a hundred percent landline not um, it didn't have a mobile amount until perhaps recently but the um, yeah I question whether it's an expense we need when we when we don't necessarily think it's great information. I, those are valid questions and so that's what we're looking at over the next few months is a review of the of the process that we use i think there is this, having the perception a broad perception of the community in certain areas i think can be useful but i the scope some of the questions i think we can be, we can target better by having point of service questions so people who use a service survey them on the spot when they actually use it rather than the perception but that's we will be undertaking a review of the of what op options are out there in terms of getting uh, of surveying um, perception and whether or not we can move to um, online uh, um, online processes or, or mixed methodology or or if indeed whether there's value in it at all. So we will under try to take a review of, of that over the coming months with a look to from July one next you know reporting from the next financial year to have um, say a stronger or more robust process. Great, thank you. Um, are we in the commercial operations section as well, or is that next? Okay, I'll hold that question. Okay, Larry, then Sandra. Just, just following up on um, Councillor Dowsing's 
Um, I mean, most people are online nowadays. What, wouldn't it be easy to do survey monkeys and just stagger them to a um, certain um, amount of emails through the year to get a, an overall view of, um, of our performance? You know, a survey monkey is something that most people can do. And if, as long as you don't um, have it too complicated or too many questions, but something simplistic, I'm sure you would be able to get a way better result and a better turnout than what you would um, previously with our previous method. So, you know, um, there's ways our community, when it comes to our performance, I'm, I'm sure the community is going to be um, eager to, to put their view across of how they see us um, performing on their behalf. So I think it's been established now that staff are urgently looking into fit for purpose, modern day comms, which speak to our community in a way that they want to communicate with us. Correct, Tim? Correct. Thank you. Sandra. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my question is around the, um, the two first points in the LTP commitments on 2.15. Um, the review and refer focus of the CDM group plan 21 to 26, and the review by the National Emergency Management Agency, so NEMA, Technical Advisory Group. Now, um, my question is from the point of view of uh, uh, efficiencies within council, um, which is the chicken and which is the egg, which comes first? How does this dovetail together so that we're not trying to reinvent the wheel when we're reinventing the wheel? <laughs> Who's going to answer about reinventing the wheel? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dave Wilson. <laughs> so through your worship, we've been working closely with NEMA on the reforms. They have been keeping us up to date with what they are proposing and the different structures from a governance level right down to an operation. Um, when you say which is going to come first, it'll be as they come out, we're trying to keep up with each other. So as they develop their things, we're trying to make sure we can retrofit anything we need to, but a lot of it is um, in parallel, but crossing over sometimes. I, I can't help you on it, it's chicken and egg. Thank you. Okay, any more questions of Mr. Beatty and his wide department? <laughs> Councillor Akawaka Brown. I'm going to go. Interesting that your wide department, you're not answering the question, <laughs> sir. <laughs> He's managed it well. Okay. I, I just firstly want to thank um, our governance and democracy staff uh, for all the mahi that was done uh, in this last quarter uh, with, all, with respect to uh, our review and um, all that you've put in the time and energy, James, to, uh, to teach <laughs> online. Um, but I, I just wondered if. Uh, with all due respect to news and teaching, be it in the media of the newspaper, yesterday's news, today's fish and chip paper, how do we <laughs> maintain a relationship? Because with this next election, it's going to be a really interesting time of how much people understand. And as I mentioned to you today, a question that I was asked last night, that I wasn't, you know, with regard to who can stand and how they're uh, in the different roles, etc. But I just wanted, well, we have a, um, a place constant to keeping in touch with our public around that review, just to keep people informed around it, so that at the end, or at the time of the election, there's not this whole, oh, what do we do, <laughs> the kind of thing. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Akuhata Brown. Um, our team have been already thinking about and working on, um, you know, an education piece with the community, twofold, really. Um, one will be the outcome of the final representation review in terms of the change. And it is significant change that the community will be going through in that regard. But in addition to that, the fact that we're moving to STV. Uh, so we're, we're working on that piece and rolling it out um, in the new year. And we're ensuring that we're keeping all our, you know, we've done a lot of good, good groundwork through the representation review in terms of establishing good networks and opportunities to engage with our community. And so we intend to keep those going along as we move through the next phase. So just moving through the objection and appeal process and the commission process, and then we'll kick into those education pieces, um, uh, which, you know, are going to be significant uh, for us to make sure that we get across to the community and that they're well understood. Thank you. Okay, councillors, last question from Councillor Hughes. What's that? You were just waving at me. Okay. Mr. Beatty, thank you. 
Yes, go for gold. Um, but it's page 220 with, um, with respect to progress on um, plan. And I'm just um, curious, it's a third box from the bottom. We talk about reporting to TEAC on commencing a regional just transition plan in November. And that just flags for me that this council is not particularly well informed about what's going on at TEAC. And I raised last week, we're not particularly well informed about what is going on at Rautupu Aura. So what is that um, report going to look like? Is it going to come to this report in here? Is this going to come to council before it goes to TEAC? And can we understand better, and I did get an undertaking from the Mayor, that there'll be a process that enables the Council to understand what Rautupu Aura is working on? Because at the minute, we all seem to be working in isolation. So through you, Your Worship, Sorry, thank through you. you, Your Worship, the report on the Just Transition, it, it's really an inception of the project. So it's a very high level introduction to a project and some information about um, what engages some principles for engagement. But we will be reporting to council on that and also the wider climate change portfolio as a, as a package, um, probably early next year. I don't think we'll get to council this year. Supplementary next year, if it's our report to team, would we see it? I mean, even if it, at the time that it goes to team? Mr. CEO, can you comment on the team report? report. <laughs> Is Joe in charge of that? Yeah, through you, Chair. It's really um, Trust Hierarchy's report. Um, we've provided some feedback and on their report. We haven't seen the final version ourselves. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing. And I appreciate the position that it's put you in through you, Madam Chair. It just seems that we've got a number of entities now in this region. Well, all with the absolute best will in the world, but are tending to be working in isolation. Nadine. Um, for your worship, uh, so, so there is a framework, um, there is a connect up across um, the different operational collaborations across the region, so primarily they are chief executives and senior officials and senior staff members that participate in TEAP, there is a tile group, um, they're all connected to Daitapudo and all that, so I'm happy to bring you um, a, a graph as to show what, what we all the connects up connecting parts are. I think also your worship um, could get confirmation from the partners around the table to be able to share the agenda with um, yep. with council so councillors so you can see see the um, what's going up and what's being discussed. Oh, through you Madam Chair to the Chief Executive would that be helpful because I mean council shares what it's doing probably our material available and just to become aware that there are a number of pieces of going on, but do we know if they're all joined up? And you've alluded to the fact that they're not, but it's not visible to the business. Thank you very much. Okay, and we're going to move on to commercial operations. Thank you, Mr. Beatty, or are you commercial operations man as well? You're not that wide. Thank you. Pauline, welcome to the table. This is the last korero on this, um, in this report. Councillors, I saw uh, Councillor Hughes go first, then Councillor Dowsing. Thank you. I'm hoping to steal Councillor Dowsing's talking points for a change. Um, just, uh, it's probably part of a bigger plan and bigger paper. Just see, seeing where our community housing uh, sits in our strategy. I'm guessing it's mortgage free, is that correct? And a lot of underutilized capital. And I know Gisborne Holdings is basically us, but is there a way to transfer it and use that capital? For greater leverage and where it sits in general with other social housing providers because i see that our, our goal return is between two to four percent and so it's kind of like we're kind of snuck in the middle somewhere and maybe it's just because i'm new to councils that i haven't been a part of any plans in, in the past but i'm just interested to know what the plan is for it um pretty worship so the the most of that returns is actually the returns from ghl as a shareholder uh, as we've said within the, the community housing is only a small part of that and there's not, um, so that percentage won't change majority of those other things over there. Part of the uh, 
housing strategy, there is a uh, review of that. We put that in the long-term plan, which is in Joe's team. So that will look at our own stock and the wider um, issues that we have in here. So that is underway this year. Um, and that will come back. Um, what are the outcomes of that? What do we need to do? What are we doing with our own? Councillor Dowsing, did he steal your thunder or not? No, he no, um, he, he reappropriated my thunder from a previous meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, I was going to be a little harsher. Actually, I was going to say that um, that, that putting all these under the, the title of commercial operations is a little bit uh, uh, a little bit inconsistent. Commercial being the uh, seeking to make a return on it, and um, we're, we're not currently really making a return on it. Um, I yeah, it, it's a review coming up for the housing that. It's important, I, I believe, um, whether we continue to be a subsidised housing provider um, versus a commercial housing provider, um, whether we use that ability to not increase our balance street, but increase, uh, sorry, not increase our income, but increase our commercial holdings uh, so that we can provide more housing um, and ultimately um, when we have a title like small holdings of property um, to understand the opportunity that sits there because if I had small holdings of property personally I would I would understand what my intentions were with it and here there is no outlined intention so actually um, a focus on commercial operations being commercial um, not just from our uh, CC, CCO but also from us if we're going to hold commercial assets is essential um, and yeah, I disagree with transferring the property. If I was going to transfer it, I'd expect a great big lot of cash coming over with it because they are um, they are an asset that would net us more sold than um, than transferred. Um, but I personally think that we can um, leverage them to increase our housing stock, which would be a far better outcome for us than than necessarily a, um, a cash return. Thank you. Any other feedback on our commercial operations? If not, do I have a mover? I'm going to move this paper. Yeah. Myself, seconded by Councillor Faulkner. Thank you to staff for bringing this back to us. It's fantastic to see the great work happening in our organisation. And all in favour? Aye. Aye. Three carried. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Okay, we are moving to our last report on this public agenda, which is on page 231, where we will talk about the district licensing committee. Every year they report back on numbers and fees and stuff like that. So, Councillor Seymour, do you want to give us a quick korero as you're the chair? Thank and you. then we can pass this. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think I've got a conflict of interest, so I'm happy to move the report. I just want to draw the, to attention and um, the report's compiled by council officers, obviously, and the point is made in here that we have a relatively consistent um, level of both licenses, and you'll see there's not a huge change in premise license. There's more of a change in um, numbers of manager certificates because that's an individual thing. Um, but there's a slight uh, turnover of managers as people come and go within the district. And it might be of interest that a manager certificate is for one year the first time and three years after that. So that means that does um, make those figures look uh, larger than it, than it possibly would be otherwise. But the facts, uh, the points of the evidence can speak for themselves as in the numbers. And it's interesting that there have been no applications to climb. There's been no hearing. There is one hearing coming up quite soon and has been delayed several times, but it wasn't um, in the year to 31 June, to 30 June anyway. So there have been no public hearings at all in the financial year for which this is reported. And there have been no manager's licenses to client. So I think that's credit to um, the individuals and to the effort council officers make to training and workshops online for people to keep up to date with legislation. So happy to move, Madam Chair. Any questions yes. of, oh, lots of hands. Councillor Akwata Brown, you go first, and then Councillor Hughes. 
Uh, kia ora, I just um, want to reference uh, my role that I have with Te Marawata. Um, te Marawata were engaged regard, regarding the uh, Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act, which has been reviewed, and the questions posed to me and a couple of others around uh, the role of Te Tiriti or Waitangi regarding this particular act. So I wasn't able to get in touch with Councillor Seymour to discuss my interview with one of the um, agents um, because timing, et cetera, et cetera. But I just want to note that I've been in speaks to uh, that, particularly pertaining to our district licensing committee, um, just to let you all know. And it's just really about the review of the act and how much better we could do for Tangata Whenua, Mana Whenua, and those impacted mostly uh, through alcohol, be it in a negative sense. But uh, yeah, that's kind of a part of a report I shall report back to you at some stage. Kia ora. Kia ora. Councillor Hughes. Oh, my query is just on page 235. So in terms of the inspectors and enforcement staff, is 2021 kind of the expected like fully staff normal? Who is the person in charge of? Okay, Helen's trying Helen, to. Helen, are you still online, Helen? I am indeed. Um, I think I've also got uh, Julie Lloyd uh, in the room. Julie, who... Thank you. Um, we'll ask Julie to comment. Julie, did you hear the question? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, we have um, just recently um, uh, hired a new um, team member to support the team, uh, predominantly in the alcohol licensing area. Um, that person will take some time to upskill. Um, but yeah, we hope to see um, an increase in uh, processing of applications and renewal because of that extra resource. Yeah, so further to that, I understand fees fluctuate because of the first year um, and then after that it's going to be three years. Um, but I can just see with the rate payer funded percentage whether that's quite high compared to prior years from my understanding and whether fees need to be adjusted to allow for that. More of a user pay system. Um, so there's probably a couple of things. If there was fluctuations, we would uh, phase it so you don't have that spike in mm. rates and go through and, and manage those kind of things. If we believe that that level of fee is 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 correct, but it's just because it's coming every three years, so we would manage those fluctuations in another mechanism. Yeah. Um, so, but we would just need to double check on this particular one that is it actually true or is it actually um, uh, just the, the way that it's reported. So we can come back with those. Yeah, so just a fixed cost of 250K and we're on average collecting 150. Is that, do we want ratepayers to be consistently funding 100,000? Mm, no, and that might not be the case, but yeah. No, but we, for that particular reason, when you were saying it is a fluctuation, we would manage the way that we do that as opposed to because the funds just come in at different timings. Yeah. Uh, and, and through you, Madam Chair, just a quick note, uh, most of the fees and charges in relation to alcohol are set through the legislation, so we don't have the option to change those. Okay, thank you for that. It was, and it's referred to in this paper, an external um, council or someone who's retired, employed for a time to catch up because there was some delay, so that probably slightly skewed the, uh, the figure for the um, financial year to 2021. All in favour? Aye. Contrary carried. So I declare this meeting closed. We've got a quick 10, 15 minutes to freshen up. Then we have the lovely blessing of, um, of I know that I closed the public part of the meeting so we can turn off the um, feed then. Then after we will come back, we have more to do. So, public meeting.